In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, we read the following. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live by the bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him up on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on their hands, they will bear you up, lest you, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all, all these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. When Jesus was in the desert praying and fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, initially the, Satan comes to, to tempt him with something that everyone needs, food. But it's fascinating to me that his final temptation is one of pride. He, he, shows, he shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. He says, Jesus, you can have it all. Wealth, power, prestige, status. You could have the world at your hands and you could tell anyone to do anything. All the glory, everything of all the kingdoms. Satan saying, Jesus, I will give them to you if you just worship me. I have to understand that, that if Satan's final temptation or attempt a temptation, attempt to test Jesus, I have to understand that if Jesus' final attempt is one to get him to take on earthly authority and earthly power and earthly prestige and earthly status and position, I have to understand that that will be one of Satan's tools against me. If he was willing to do it to Jesus, he's definitely willing to do it to me. He's willing to do it to all of us. That wealth, prestige, status, power, the highest position, great renown, kingdoms, and all their glory will be something that Satan will attack us with. We've been going through a series, Ordinary People, Radical Joy, looking at the Philippian church and, and Paul's letter to the Philippian church. And today, today we, we look at a part in this letter where Paul outlines the prestige that he had. He once had it made as far as religious circles, he, he had the greatest resume out there. He had it all. He had it all. But he counted it all lost for knowing Jesus. Turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those, those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. 
Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Before we get into this passage and what it's really all about, there's, there's this word out there, there's this thing out there that's, that we got to kind of deal with. Now, as a pastor, you know, there's temptation to scale over awkward moments in Scripture, and you just kind of talk about the other thing, but that doesn't really benefit anybody, and, well, let's face it, sometimes awkward, weird things can give us a few chuckles. Paul throws out this word, circumcision. Now, I'm going to assume you know what circumcision is. If you don't, you can Google it, but please stay away from Google Images. And for those of us, for those who may have not grown up in the church and around religious circles, you you could be asking yourself, what does circumcision have anything to do with the Philippian church? Why would Paul be talking about flesh and circumcision, mutilation of the flesh? This is not just weird and awkward, kind of gross. No amens? Okay. So Paul says, look out for the dogs. The evildoers, the mutilate the flesh. Okay? Uh, this, This thing with dogs, it's interesting. Because the religious elite... They would call, when when Gentiles or non-Jewish people started to come to know Jesus and started coming into the church, there was like a, there was a problem that we're going to look at between religious leaders that carried the, the, the promise of God, the covenant of God, and then there's these new people that are brought in with Jesus saying to the Jew first, now to the Greek, or now to the non-Jew, and wait a second, now everything, everyone can come to know Jesus, everyone can be saved. And the religious leaders didn't like that. And they actually called non-Jewish people who weren't circumcised or men, they would call them dogs. This was a slur to them. What's fascinating is Paul does a flip of irony here by calling the religious leaders dogs. Probably the worst thing that he called them. So the whole sticks and stones thing, names are going to hurt in this one. Um, But let's... Let's ask this question, what does it have to do with the Philippian church? Well, in order to figure that out, in order to really understand, we kind of, we got to go all the way back. We're going all the way back to Genesis this morning. And we're going to do it all. We're going to cover the whole Bible in 30 minutes. Who's excited? So we're going to go back to Genesis 17. We, we got to figure this thing out. This, this awkward thing of circumcision, and he says, we are the circumcision? This is so weird, Paul, come on. Throw us a bone here. What are you talking about here? Come on. What's going on? So you go back to Genesis 17. And in Genesis 17, we find a guy by the name of Abraham. And Abraham and his wife, Sarah, they, they, they had no kids. And they, she was barren. And God comes to Abraham and he says, you know what? I'm going to make you the father of the entire Hebrew nation. And I'm going to bless you. And his wife laughed. And... Uh, there's a covenant that, was, that the Lord made with Abraham, that God made with Abraham, that, is, that generations and generations and generations, that, that he would have more descendants than the stars in the sky. And at this time, this is like the greatest blessing ever, especially for a couple that couldn't have children. But there's a catch to the covenant. So let's look at that. In verse 7 to 10, Genesis 17, 7 to 10, and I'll highlight the the key verses here. So in 7 to 10, God's talking to Abraham and he says, And I will establish my covenant, or like this deep promise, between me, God, and you, Abraham, and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. to, To be God to you and to put offspring after you. And I will give you and your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, 
all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And if you jump down to verse 13, it says this. Uh, let's start 12. He who is eight days old among you, you shall, be cir- you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he and who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh, an everlasting covenant. So this is kind of the start of circumcision that now many different Traditions, even today, this is a practice. But even still, it's like, okay, I don't really see the connection, Jeremy. This is, why would, why would God ask this? What, what does it have to do with that part of the body? This is, this is still kind of awkward. Well, there's an awesome, uh, there's an awesome article at ChristianityToday.com. And they just go in and they answer that question. Why, why did God choose circumcision? And I'd encourage you, if you want to know more, this is a, a it's a long article, uh, a big, giant study about with all sorts of stuff. But I wanted to grab this one paragraph because I, I think the author states it clearly. The covenant of circumcision came in the context of the promise of an abundant seed from Genesis seventeen sixteen that would inherit and inhabit and therefore be fertile on the land that Yahweh, God, promises. Circumcision sealed the deed of inheritance for the land. Yahweh promised fertility, but indicated that Abraham would father the seed only when he gave up fleshly hope. Circumcision was the, quote, fruitful cut, unquote, in Abram's flesh. It is no accident that Abram could father the child of the promise Isaac only after he was circumcised. So for whatever reason... Some obvious in that, there's one part of the body that leads to fertility. And so as a sign, as a covenant, this is what God instituted. And there are, you know, there's different scholars and things like that that talk about ancient times and that this might have been a, also had a cleanliness practice to it. And there's all those different debates that go along with it, which we can leave to the side and you can debate on your own. The deal is that this, this was something that God required as part of the covenant promise that all Jewish men, all Hebrew men, would to have this done. And anyone coming into the Judeo faith, the Hebrew faith, would have to do this. This was the covenant. And that if this was happening, then fertility, and he would have descendants and descendants. Now, what I'm not saying here, this, especially on the podcast, because you're probably tuned right in now, is that I'm not saying that circumcision automatically leads to fertility. And so couples that might be struggling to get pregnant, this is not going to be a quick fix. This is not what it's saying. Just so you know, even if you do have Jewish descent, I I don't know if I can really state that that's going to happen and put some guarantees on that. But this was the requirement back then under the old covenant. Well, now let's fast forward a little bit. Let's go into Leviticus. So you're in Genesis. We're going Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Third book of the Bible. This is the Levitical law or the law of the tribe of Levi. Everyone's looking at me with eyes glossed over like, I cannot believe we're talking about this. Can we talk about this in church? It's in the Bible. You're allowed. All the kids downstairs are like, man, we missed a good lesson. No, my boys would be. Okay, so anyway, uh, we're looking at Leviticus. Leviticus 12. Leviticus chapter 12. So this is when, so now the covenant under Abraham, now, now it's going to become covenant law. It's going to, uh, with Moses, it's going to become law. And here we go. If you look at the first three verses here, the Lord spoke to Mo- Moses saying, so he's about to give him some laws here. Speak to the people of Israel saying, if a woman conceives and bears a male child, then she shall be unclean for seven days. As at that time of her menstruation, she shall be unclean. Just in case we didn't get any more awkward conversations this morning, we got some more here. And on the eighth day, the, at the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So now this covenant is now becoming covenant law. This, this is a requirement for God's people. It's not an optional thing. This is a requirement. Well, now let's fast forward. For those of us who have been around church, we know that Jesus changed this whole thing up. 
that all these laws, including circumcision, all these laws that people had to adhere to, Jesus comes and he says, I'm here to fulfill the law. Now I come to not only come to the Jew, but also to the Greek or to the Gentile. And all of a sudden, Jesus comes on the scene and basically blows up the identity of the Hebrew people and says, <clears throat> God's opening salvation to all people through me. And here's the catch. It's going to be based on heart condition, not based on works and the things that you do. And it's going to be based on the condition of your heart instead of following a list of rules. Well, it was radical. And, and we know this is, this is one of the key reasons why Jesus was put to death because his teaching was so radical. And why many religious leaders would still call Gentiles or non-Jews would call them dogs. This is part of it. Their identity was just being blown up. And in Acts 15, now go to Acts 15, you've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament in the last half of your Bible. And then we have Acts, which is the accounts of the early church. So the Holy Spirit drops on the people and the church explodes and people start coming to know Jesus from all over the modern world. And, and it's a problem in a sense because now the disciples are kind of arguing, okay, well, how much of the law do we need to follow? And now we got like, we got Greeks and Persians and we, we got all sorts of people coming to know Jesus. How much of the Jewish law do we make them? What are we going to do? And there's a debate going on. Look at Acts 15. Acts chapter 15. So in Acts chapter 15, we see this right at the top. It's called the Jerusalem Council. Right here it says, But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, quote, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, the law that we read about in Leviticus, you cannot be saved. Okay, wait a second. Now circumcision and salvation are the same thing. We got a crazy false teaching going on. And huge debate breaks out. Skip down to verse 6. Verse 6 in Acts 15, it says this. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate... Peter stood up. Now, Peter was the one whom Jesus said, Jesus said to Peter, on you, you are the rock, on you I will build my church. So he's like one of the first people to start the church. And so there's all this debate, all this discussion on how much of the law do we fit into salvation? What are we going to do? Peter stands up and says, that's it. Here's the deal. And here's what Peter gives them a strong rebuke here. And he says, brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. In other words, I was told to go out and preach to the non-Jew, to the Gentiles. That was, that was what I was commissioned to do by Jesus. You know this, guys. And he says this, And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did. Just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them. Having cleansed their hearts by faith. So Peter steps up and he says, look, there's no, there's, no, there's no distinction anymore. Jesus came and it's about the heart condition. It's about faith. What's inside? It's not about what you do. It's not about all the status and following the list of rules on how many things, including circumcision. Now let's bounce all the way back, all the way forward again to Philippians 3. Now that we have a little bit of context and we understand what the battle is, in the Philippian church, we have some of these religious leaders, what's referred to as Judaizers, and they're, they're, they're infiltrating the church that Paul and Timothy have planted in Philippi, and they're trying to press this works-based system, this law-based system. They're trying to, it's like they want to they throw back to the old days. They don't like the system where it's faith alone. They don't like the system where it's based on your heart condition. They like the system where you work and work and work and where you tick all the boxes. And once you've ticked all the boxes, then you can go to heaven. And so they're starting to teach the Philippian church this. And Paul is not too excited about it. He's furious. And so he calls them mutilators of flesh, not because anyone who circumcised or gets circumcised is, is a mutilator of flesh. No, that's not. It's the reason they're doing it. And these guys are trying to teach the church that you've got to do this thing have this procedure and you can get into heaven. It's craziness. And Paul's furious. And 
Part of the reason why I think Paul is so upset is he knows his people. He knows the Philippian church and he knows the way Satan's going to tempt them. Uh, Chris Young, a lot, uh, he preached a message a couple weeks ago. Now, last week I said Chris spoke a message and some of you were like, Swaffield preached? No, he didn't. It was Chris Young. So sometimes when you throw out a Chris in our church, you got to define it. So Chris Young preached a message a couple weeks ago and he went into some detail about Philippian culture, about how wealthy it was, about the status, the position, the prestige. This is something that attracted them. Paul knows this about them. So all of a sudden these holy rollers come into the Philippian church and they're like, guys, look at here's the list of things that you need to do to attain our status. We, the religious leaders, we, the Judaizers, look at us. To become like us, you need to do this and this and this and this. Paul's furious. These dogs, these evil doers, these mutilators of flesh. Do they not know we are the circumcision? This law doesn't matter. It's about our hearts. It's no longer about the flesh. It's no longer about this body. This body's going to die and decay. It's about our hearts. Jesus came and he fulfilled that system. And so... <laughs> Paul lays out his resume. I, I feel like when I read this, I feel like if it rhymed, this would be like the first hip hop verse in the Bible. I feel like it's just like spoken word. Um, yeah, if propaganda, we're laying this down. Whoever does, if you don't know who propaganda is, you can Google it, but Christian hip hop artist. But this, this whole thing, he says, he's like, uh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He's basically saying, don't, church, don't get caught up in this status. If we're going to compare resumes, these guys that are tempting you, they have nothing on me. Before Jesus found me, I was at the top. I could snap my fingers and Christians could die. I went wherever I wanted. I did whatever I wanted. I had security. I had wealth. I had position. I had power. I had authority. I made the call on people's lives. You want to you compare resumes with me? I'll show you a comparison. But then he says this, but I count it all loss in comparison to knowing Jesus loss. And the, the idea behind this loss, the, the idea behind this loss, it's an old word for damages. Um, Robertson's Word Pictures talks about it this way. It's only found in Philippians here in this passage, and it's also found in Acts in regards to like uh, shipping and, and a loss to the ship and the cargo. Um, it's kind of a, a business term, like the debit side of the ledger versus the credit. So here, pretend, pretend you're in this kind of ancient age and you own a bunch of stuff that supplies that you need to get to another port. And, and so you, you rent a ship, you get the captain, you hire a crew, and all these things are in your expense column. These are expenditures that you know are going to happen. But their expenses, these expenses are worth it because the cargo that you're going to ship, you're going to get paid for that and it'll be worth it. But you know that maybe, maybe a sale will rip or there's going to be some other damage. So you've also got some, some maintenance costs that you need to kind of look forward to. And these are all expenditures that you know are coming. But then all of a sudden, mid-journey, your ship is just dashed against the rocks. And the whole thing is lost. Sure, the ship might have been insured and maybe your cargo, but maybe not. And let's say all your cargo and everything that you're about to receive, not only you have the expenses now, but now you have damages, you have full loss. Everything is gone. Everything you sent is done. There's, there's no income. It's over. It's loss. This is what Paul's talking about. He had it all. And Jesus shipwrecked his life. He met Jesus and he lost everything. Like a ship dashed against the rocks, he had nothing but Jesus. But here's the catch. In the very next sentence, now that he knows Jesus, 
Now that he has experienced Jesus, he says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. Here's the key. I count them as rubbish. What he's saying is I had everything. I had the power, the status, I had it all. And I met Jesus and I lost everything. But now that I know him, it's like, I, it's like all this stuff was garbage. This was all the refuse and the rubbish that I never needed in my life anyway. And now that it's, it's gone, I realize I, I'm perfect. I never needed any of it. And again, he knows his Philippian people. He knows his church and he's saying, you people, this temptation for more wealth, for more power, for more prestige to get a higher position It's refuse, it's rubbish, it's garbage in comparison to have a life wholly lived for Jesus Christ. And I know, if anyone knows, he's saying, I should know I was at the top. And I'm telling you, at the bottom, it's better. We know this, history tells the tale. Look at the Great Depression, thousands upon thousands of people jumping out of buildings, committing suicide, They had put everything into their power and their big buildings and and top of their game and the corporate ladder and money and then the bottom falls out and they have nothing, nothing without Jesus. Hollywood has one of the highest levels of addiction and suicide and everything. They have all the popularity, the prestige, but without Jesus, it's nothing. There is no amount of Facebook likes or Instagram hearts that will give you the identity and meaning in your life that you're, that you're crying for, that you need in your life. Jesus, only Jesus will fulfill that. That's it. Popularity, status, it's fleeting. And G- Satan does not want you to look at him. He wants you to look at you. He doesn't want you to look at him wants you to look at you. And if you can look long enough at yourself, if I can look long enough at myself, he knows that I will turn my eyes off of Jesus. And I will be so worried about all my needs and my wants and what I identify as. And then if I can focus enough on that, then Jesus will be forgotten and the word of God will be forgotten and Satan has us locked up. As we close, we need to ask, you know, what loss are we willing to incur for Jesus? The status of our career, prestige of possessions, security of our home, our race, our nationality, our sexuality, how we feel about something, what we think about something, our entire identity. Like that's what happened to the Hebrew people. That's why they had such a difficulty with it. Jesus came and he, he, their race, their nationality, their identity as a people. All of a sudden he says, you're no longer chosen people. All people can be chosen. And maybe you're here this morning and you just kind of rolled into this place and you're kind of like, you're like, wow, this is heavy. And uh, we preach the gospel here. And the reality is, is that anything you are chasing in life, it will be fleeting. The Bible is clear that Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, the person and power of Jesus is the only thing that will truly fulfill you and all this other stuff that Satan's going to tempt you with, it's not going to go anywhere. And so this morning as we, as we worship, you know, I encourage us all, let's pause and think about that. Is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough for us or do we need all these other layers of things in our life? If we were to take it all away, if we were all shipwrecked and we just had Jesus, would we be satisfied in that? Maybe we need to, to sing that out, to affirm it. Maybe we need to sit and reflect. Maybe you need prayer. There is something that you are battling and Satan is pounding you this week. Come forward and have the elders or I pray for you. Um, we're also, I'll ask the ushers to come forward and we also give as a form of worship. We, we realize that in this system and in this world, we can only have a, an impact uh, through monetary ways sometimes and projects that we want to do do cost money. But we also know in scripture that giving is not an obligation or a guilt thing with God. It's a form of worship. We sing, we pray, we read, we worship in a lot of ways. And this is, this is one of them. 
And uh, so if you're willing, if you're new here, don't feel obligated. That's not what we want. But um, if you'd like to worship, I assure you that the, the money used in this church and its projects go to reach and teach people about Jesus Christ. So I can affirm that uh, any money you do give will be used here. Let's pray together. Dear Father, may we count everything as loss. May we count it all rubbish, refuse, uh, in comparison to knowing your son, Jesus. Father, if there's anyone who doesn't know you this morning, Lord, I pray that they would repent and that they would receive you, that they would repent of their sin and that they would accept Jesus Christ into their life. Lord, for the things we give this morning, some of us may give a little, some may give a lot, but whatever we give, Lord, may it be in worship. And Father, we ask that every cent given this morning be used to reach and teach more people about your son, Jesus. May we lift up your name one more time, Lord. May we just be filled with your spirit and not hold back in in giving you glory this morning. I thank you so much for Paul. I thank you so much for his rebuke of this this system that Satan tempts us with to to climb religious ladders, to climb corporate ladders, to, to climb ladders of wealth and possession. Father, please continue to rebuke us. May we not chase what this world has to offer. May we use the blessings we have to honor you. In Jesus' name.